As we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may you challenge us and comfort us with these words of scripture. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Acts, chapter nine, verses one through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The main characters in this story represent two sides of a debate as polarized as our current political climate. When Jesus was crucified, the religious leaders hoped his death would put an end to his radical ideas once and for all. But even with Jesus gone, his followers keep showing up, speaking in tongues, preaching in public, even saying Jesus had risen from the dead. It is the worst kind of blasphemy for the Jews, and Saul, a brilliant, ambitious, and faithful young Jewish leader, has made it his personal mission to stop them. This isn't the first time we hear about Saul. In Acts chapter 8, Saul attends the stoning to death of the apostle Stephen, and though it's not clear if he actually participated in this murder, clearly he approved of it. Then we hear that Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Imagine a split screen. On the one side, Saul riding to Damascus with warrants in his hand, propelled by a murderous, righteous rage, convinced that his mission justifies his violent actions. On the other side of the screen is Ananias, about whom we know very little, except he lives in Damascus and is a disciple of Jesus. We can be reasonably sure, though, that Ananias is convinced of two things. One, that Jesus is Lord. And two, 
that Saul is his worst enemy. Clearly, these are two people who should be kept as far apart as possible. Put them together and you can almost guarantee something bad would happen. But suddenly, on his journey to Damascus, Saul is stopped dead in his tracks by a blinding light and a voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Through this voice, Saul learns that when he persecutes the followers of Jesus, he is persecuting Jesus himself. Then Saul is struck blind. Now picture faithful Ananias going about his business, not looking for a confrontation with anyone when suddenly Jesus appears before him saying, get up and go find Saul of Tarsus and lay hands on him so that he can see again because he is the one who will preach the gospel to the Gentiles and to royalty and to the Jews. <laughs> I must have misheard you, Lord, we can imagine Ananias saying politely, because it kind of sounded like you said Saul of Tarsus, who would probably kill me if I tried to touch him and who couldn't possibly preach the gospel to anyone. He doesn't even believe you are Lord. How could he preach anything except bigotry and hatred. <laughs> Can't you just see Jesus smiling gently at the sightless Saul groping in the dark and then turning that same smile upon Ananias who is completely incredulous? Can't you just imagine Jesus smiling at them, loving them both, and marveling at how hard it is for human beings to believe that God's love and grace really does extend to everyone, and that God invites each one of us to go outside our carefully established boundaries and comfort zones to share this good news? The great country singer Merle Haggard died a few years ago on his 79th birthday. He died a legend, hailed as the poet of the common man, with 40 number one hits and dozens in the top 10. But for the first two decades of his life, such success looked highly unlikely. Haggard was just nine years old when his father died, and not long after, his rebellious streak led to multiple stints in reform school. At 18, Haggard was sentenced to 15 years in San Quentin prison for his role in a robbery. He was at San Quentin two years later when Johnny Cash performed his first ever prison concert there. Of Johnny Cash's prison debut, Haggard said this, he had the right attitude. He chewed gum, looked arrogant, and flipped the birds to the guards. He did everything the prisoners wanted to do. He was a mean mother from the South who was there because he loved us. When he walked away, everyone in that place had become a Johnny Cash fan. After hearing Cash, Haggard earned his high school equivalency and joined the prison's country band. Just six years after his release, he had his number one hit. He became close friends with Johnny Cash, who always encouraged him to write honest songs about his criminal past, which Haggard did. Reflecting on the change in his life that happened after hearing Johnny Cash in that first prison concert, Haggard once said, I was just on the wrong direction, and someone, something, turned me around. God hit me on the upside of the head. It's fair to say that God has a habit of doing this and a mean left hook. God is constantly taking our no way, our we've never done that before, our that makes no sense, and transforming them into yes. God is always in the business of rearranging our ways of seeing, being, and acting in the world, often by showing us how our ways of seeing, being, and acting are entirely too limited. Can you imagine what it was like for Ananias to lay his hands on Saul? the mortal enemy, not just of Ananias himself, but of all those he cared for. Can you imagine what it was like for Ananias to speak to Saul of love and mercy? 
Can you imagine what it was like for the newly baptized Saul to walk into a room full of Jesus' disciples and ask their forgiveness for how he had treated them and their friends? Can you imagine Saul humbly asking to join their movement? Fortunately, this story does not suggest that it is up to us and our willpower alone to reform our misguided ways of thinking and seeing. In this story, Jesus comes to both Saul and Ananias just as they are. He comes to them and loves them just as they are. And then Jesus invites them to take up a new role in the story. We seem to think God will love us if we change, Richard Rohr writes. But over and over, the Bible reveals that God loves us so we can change. This is what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus. Jesus stopped him in his tracks and then loves and forgives him unconditionally. The only people who change, who are transformed, Rohr concludes, are people who feel safe, who feel their dignity, and who feel loved. That's what loving people do for one another, offer safe relationships in which we can change. This kind of love is far from sentimental. It has real power. Just as the first followers of Jesus were figuring out how to share the good news of God's love, how to be the church, Jesus appears to these two men, two mortal enemies, and he makes them instruments of love for each other. For Saul, this means accepting help in his blind and vulnerable state from one of the very people he had set out to destroy. For Ananias, this means extending love and grace to the last person on earth he wanted to love. For both of these men, their willingness to be God's instruments of love and the power of that non-sentimental, self-sacrificial love changes everything. Last Tuesday, after the announcement that the verdict had been reached in the Derek Chauvin trial. Reporter John Elligan went to Cup Foods, the convenience store outside of which George Floyd was murdered. People were gathering there to hear the verdict. After it was announced and word spread through the crowd that Chauvin had been found guilty on all three counts, Elligan spoke to a young man named BJ, who caught his eye because BJ stood silently with his hand raised and his head bowed. When Elegan asked BJ what he was thinking and feeling, BJ responded, I was really worried. I was worried about my city. Thank God my city will not burn tonight. This is a new day. This is something beautiful. This is something different. Finally, some little peace of justice. Like many of us, BJ received the verdict as a sign that justice was served and that change is possible. There are many others, though, who are convinced that the verdict doesn't really change anything. The evidence for their case is pretty overwhelming. Since March 29th, when the Chauvin trial began, 64 people have died at the hands of law enforcement in America, more than half of them people of color. These statistics speak to the very real challenges of policing and to the dangers police encounter daily. It also suggests that something about America's system of law enforcement is simply not working. And we could be forgiven for thinking that this will never change, that real change isn't possible. But this story we have heard today suggests otherwise. It is easy to think that Paul, 
who we probably all think of as the super apostle, the brilliant Christian theologian, the founder of many of the first churches, the writer of much of our New Testament, it's easy to think Paul was always that person. But before Paul was all those things, he was Saul, a violent, murderous man fueled by hate and prejudice. To those first Christians, Saul was the person most dangerous and fearful to them. Ananias certainly wasn't the only one convinced that Saul was irredeemable. So, if Ananias and Saul could be instruments of God's love and grace to one another, then truly anything is possible with God. As the political commentator Sarah Stewart Holland reminds us, lots of things have changed in America, things that felt like they were part and parcel of every bit of who we were, and we shifted, and we changed, and we've done it at varying speeds, but it is available to us. We don't have to keep watching communities traumatized and families ripped apart. It's so hard to remember that it doesn't have to be this way and that any small step in a different direction matters and that those steps are something we can take together. Get up and go, Jesus says. He says to Saul and Ananias alike, two people as radically opposed to one another as two people could be. Get up and go. Who are those people for us? The people at the edges, those to whom we simply cannot imagine we could ever extend God's love and mercy. We all have someone, so bring that someone to mind. And as you hold that person in your mind's eye, imagine Jesus saying to you, I love you just as you are right now with all your prejudices and your judgments and your inconsistencies and your selfishness. I love you and that is something that will never change. And because I love you, I tell you, get up and go. Be an instrument of my love. Go to those you understand and like the least, who need my love the most, and who have the most to teach you about my love. Go into the world and be instruments of that kind of unsentimental, self-sacrificial, powerful love. And watch the world change. Amen.